An intelligent LED induction light. When a man comes, it shines. Human induction lamp. Lots of induction going on here. Uh, induction in Chinese is a translation of detection. So, for instance, if it's a proximity detector, they'll call it an induction detector. I wonder if that comes from the inductive pickups uh, used in some factory equipment. So this is a rechargeable unit. It's got a little USB lead. It's got a magnetic plate to attach it to surfaces. Uh, so you can take it down and charge it. I'm not seeing... I'm seeing a bit of a lithium cell in here, I think. Uh, I'm seeing a eye hole for the hooking it on, a keyhole for hooking it on. I'm seeing the charging point, point, and I'm seeing off, auto, and on. Okay. So it comes charged. That's good. Let's get in close to this and spudger it open. Because that's what we're here for. I want to see the circuitry in here. There are no screws. It appears to just clip in from the front. Revealing. No data, no number on that integrated circuit. That's probably a microcontroller. Is this a light sensor LED? Not really sure. Um, there's a charging point port going to this chip. That's probably an LTH7, which is the miniature version of the TP4056 type chip. It is an LTH7. There's a couple of what look like transistors. I'm guessing one. That says AO9T. And the other one says 54FK. I'm guessing one of these is a voltage regulator and one will be to switch the... LEDs, which appear to be wired in parallel. This is not uncommon. The cover just pops off the photoelectric sensor. The pyroelectric sensor by our description, the pattern for red detector. Let's take the circuit board out. I want to see how big the battery is. I tell you what, this thing feels so light that I'm not expecting a big battery. Not at all. So there are two screws. But there are actually four mounting positions. Is it glued? It's not glued. Tiny battery. Oh, they could have fitted a much bigger battery in. There's a relative amount of space under here. They could have, I wonder if that can be upgraded then. Well, it can be upgraded. Oh, that's odd. The detector, because it's a single-sided board, you can actually see the tracks a lot better from this side of the board. Uh, the detector's been put through, its wires have been folded round and soldered, and likewise the battery has been stuck in the back, and uh, then the tabs have been soldered directly onto the printed circuit board. Right, tell you what, I shall get us a closer look at this, and we can reverse engineer it. I don't think there's going to be anything unique about it, but it's worth doing. One moment, please. Reverse engineering complete. Let's explore first big disappointment. This is a dedicated chip and it's not marked and I can find similar chips that do the function of this chip but I can't find one the exact same pinout. That's like one of those puzzles. I'm going to have to keep hunting for that chip, see what it is. So the USB supply comes in. This is an LTH7 uh, regulator chip with a 2000 ohm resistor uh, setting the current it charges the lithium cell at. There is a LED here with a 1K resistor in series that lights to show it's charging. I have tested the capacity of the lithium cell and it's 200 milliamp power. Not terribly generous. I've also checked the space underneath and as long as you just mash these leads flat, you've got about a six millimeter thickness. You can fit a fairly decent battery in the back of that. So you could at least double the capacity. It uses a standard pass infrared sensor with this chip. That's going to keep the costs down. It's not the one that I was thinking that would have a straightforward digital output that would be detecting, it would be using the detecting buffering internally. It's all done by this chip, which is quite odd. I shall show you that in the schematic. We have a transistor, turns out to be a MOSFET, switches the LEDs via a 6.8 ohm resistor, and we have a little voltage regulator that sets the voltage at 2.8 volts, which kind of makes sense. Uh, that's more or less it. Schottky diode in series with the sort of low voltage supply, it doesn't really matter. It's presumably just polarity protection. Right, to tell you what, if you want to try reverse engineering it yourself, noting that the translucent back of this made that much easier. 
then uh, you can just basically, well, take a picture of that and you can have a go at reverse engineering. It might make it a bit easier to see the tracks. Interesting to note that the pass infrared module has been put through, folded back around these uh, back of the circuit board and poked through these holes and then soldered. That does two things. It, uh, it means they can use a single-sided circuit board because all the soldering is on the other side. But it also means that it takes the heat away from the package when they solder it. So it's got this sort of as a heat sink. It just protects the pass infrared detector. Right. Let's take a look at the circuitry. I'll zoom down on this. I'll get these bits out of the way, in fact, because otherwise it's going to be sliding everywhere. So I'm going to show you this in two chunks. I'm going to show you the main power supply and up to the mystery PIR chip. Where it says PIR, that's going to be covered in the next page because that's the sensor and the module, the actual, the dedicated chip. So we've got the USB supply coming in, 5 volts. It goes up to the LTH7, really common circuitry. You find this in a lot of rechargeable items. It's got a 1K resistor in the LED for showing it's charging. And there's the 2K resistor that sets the current that it's going to charge the lithium cell with. 200 milliamp hour lithium cell. And then it goes, the cell goes directly to the LEDs. There's eight LEDs in parallel, a 6.8 ohm resistor, and that MOSFET. And two things can turn that MOSFET on. If you turn the power switch from off to on, it directly powers the MOSFET. It doesn't even power the circuit up. It directly powers the MOSFET via this, via this 1K resistor. If you turn it to pass infrared mode, it goes via this Schottky diode to the 2.8 volt regulator and powers the passive infrared circuitry, which can then also control that MOSFET via the 1K resistor. There are three components missing off this PCB. They've left a capacitor off across the battery, I guess. They just didn't think they needed it. They've left a capacitor off just before this voltage regulator. I guess, again, they didn't think they needed it. And they've also left what I presume is a resistor, a 10 mega ohm resistor, um, or a 10K resistor more commonly, across between the uh, gate of the MOSFET and the source to actually keep that turned off. But I'm guessing they're relying on the fact that there's probably some leakage through the module here that keeps that transistor turned off, stops it sort of floating up. The chip itself is unusual. It's using a standard PIR sensor. It's obviously got quite high gain circuitry in there. It's got two resistors, which I've not even noted the value of those. That's a bit remiss of me. 100K. And 2.2 uh, meg ohm. So 2 meg ohm 2. And they will probably be acting partially as a filter, but... Um, it's just part of the circuitry in here that it's looking for the undulation of the output from this passive infrared sensor. I tried scoping that. I couldn't get anything. It's like a tiny signal. But um, it goes, uh, the passive infrared sensor itself, which is a generic cheap sensor, has two areas on it that generate a very small voltage when they are illuminated with uh, long wave infrared. That's you, you can't see it because it's like it's not visible to the camera, but if you were using a thermal image camera, you'd see my hands are glowing with that emission. The two sensors are wired in inverse series so that if the whatever they're exposed to in common uh, cancels each other out. If you walk in front of it, the little lens, the little dimpled lens here, creates a hot spot that moves across those two sensors and one detects much more than the other and it causes a swing in output. That is buffered up through a little uh, MOSFET inside here, a little field effect transistor, and then coupled to this chip. This chip has three parameters that can be set. It has the light sensor, this little uh, sensor here. I'm not sure what it is. I've drawn it as a photo transistor. I've drawn the pin numbers in these so you can have a go at working out what this chip is. It's got three one mega ohm resistors going to the positive rail. And then it's got the light sensor going to the negative rail, feeding into pin one. And then it's got a 15K and 160K resistor feeding into pins eight and seven. So they're, they're acting as voltage dividers and setting a voltage threshold into that. One will probably be sensitivity and one will probably be the time delay that it actually turns the output on for. Um, that's about all I can say about this chip. These numbers, uh, positive uh, supply, 
is going to pin 2. Negative supply is going to pin 4. The reason they're giving it 2.8 volts is because the battery, the lithium battery, will start at, say, about uh, 4.2, and then it'll go down to about 3 at the end of charge. That still allows this to, with a low dropout regulator, it allows it to regulate roughly a 2.8 volt supply. The passive infrared sensor in the circuitry needs a stable supply. They can't be hooked across the battery directly because as the LEDs turned on and off, it would cause a massive sort of spike, a peak of current going up and down. Oh, current. That 6.8 ohm resistor, if you wanted longer battery life, you could change that for a higher value. But as at this point in time, it drops about a volt. That equates to round about um, 150 milliamps through these eight LEDs, which means each is being driven about 20 milliamps, which is within their design. That is uh, up at the top of the design of a standard generic single chip LED. But these days, of course, like they run them, they absolutely grill the same package in LED lamps. So there it is. I don't know what the chip is. I have had a long hunt. I've had a, just too long a hunt. I was just hunting all over the internet trying to get clues, but I didn't identify it. The thing that threw me was pin 2 being positive and pin 4 being negative. That's unusual in those chips. It'd be interesting to find out what it is, but having said that, there is not a lot of point because uh, it's one of those things that, you know, you and me won't be able to get those chips easily or we wouldn't have an application. We'd just tend to buy them as a module. But there we go interesting light it does work it uh, it's going to get a decent battery life i sh should think they arrived with the battery charged at almost four volts uh, so it didn't need topped up much to take it to a full charge uh, that's probably because when it's switched off it does just isolate everything but there we go it's an interesting circuit it's not a bad little unit so it's engineered down to a price it's very lightweight but it does have the benefit that you know you can upgrade this, you can uh, potentially change the battery inside it and uh, give it a boost to, of how long it's going to last. If you did change the battery to a bigger one, you could also change that resistor uh, that's used to set the current on the... Hold on, I'll show you. The resistor that's used to set the current here, that's 2K, you could change that with the LTH7 to actually charge the bigger capacity battery at a higher current. But uh, those modifications would be worthy, but as it is, it's going to do all right. It should last, depending on the amount of foot traffic in the area, it should last a decent time on a charge, and it is just magnetic, it just sticks to the ceiling. So it's uh, quite a versatile light, it's not bad, especially for that price.